there were three major COVID domains as we encountered them. One COVID domain had to do with the origin of COVID itself. Yep. The other two had to do with the utility of early treatment, drugs like ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine. Um, and the third had to do with the safety and effectiveness of vaccines, right? Now, on all three of these, we could talk about what it is that the fringe spotted that, you know, the fringe had been actively driven to the fringe, that actually there were things that the mainstream should have been talking about that it wasn't interested in talking about. Well, one thing that is true is that the fringe gets defined by taking a position that runs counter to whatever prevailing forces are running the establishment. So there are a lot of scientists, researchers, health professionals who two years ago, two and a half years ago, five years ago, uh, thought that and appeared to be completely within the mainstream in terms of, you know, doing good work, doing honest work, having integrity, uh, pursuing evidence as it, you know, pursuing evidence as it showed up and figuring out what it meant and if A, what then, you know, what B, if given A, and um, were pushed into, were vilified, were named as people on the outside because they arrived at conclusions that didn't fit. It's not that they were, they were or, many people were not already on the outside, nor were these people who were looking to be fringe, to be contrarian, to be outside of, you know, the, the, the civilized discourse of cocktail parties. There are certainly people like that. Um, but this is not the driving thing. The driving, the driving thing is what's true? What are we doing? Oh my God. There's this, there's this evolving situation, quite literally on many levels. What is true of it? And therefore, what can we do to better ourselves, um, in the face of, you know, COVID two years ago and to prepare for such a thing in the future? What is the likelihood of such a thing? And what is this thing? What is the nature of the thing? Right. And in fact, um, one of the things that tells you that COVID is an incredibly screwed up, I would argue, upside down landscape is the high quality of the people who are supposedly French, mm -hmm. right? So you've got, you know, Tess Lorry, uh, uh, at Tess Lurie and John Campbell on ivermectin, Tess Lurie literally being a, a, a highly decorated WHO scientist. You've got um, Pierre Corey, you know, who has, you know, literally written a textbook on pulmonology and is a highly decorated ICU doc, right? You've got um, one of the world's most published cardiologists, uh, Peter McCullough. Peter McCullough. Mm -hmm. You have, um, you know, literally one of the uh, arguably the primary architect of the uh, mRNA technology that went into vaccines, raising alarm about these mRNA vaccines. Mm -hmm. You really couldn't ask for more highly qualified people, right? But nonetheless, they are portrayed as if they are fringe. Um, in fact, we will get we will get back to Sam here a little bit later. But Sam actually wondered aloud. Sam, who? Sam Harris mm -hmm. uh, wondered aloud in in uh, one of his podcasts on the subject whether the explanation for these people was that they were simply part of the small percentage of the society that's schizophrenic. Well, and this actually. Um because because we have so much to talk about, let me just slip in here something that I thought we might spend more time on. But um, uh, Luc Montagnier died in February. Uh, he was a Nobel laureate. He received the Nobel in 2008, I want to say. Um, uh, it, it was a co-recipient, uh, and he and she shared it with someone else. And I'm not, I'm not just not remaining the specifics, um, but he shared it uh, with, gosh, I've forgotten her name, uh, for the discovery of, of HIV. Uh, and uh, there have certainly been people who received the Nobel who later on people came to think, oh, I'm not, I'm not so sure about that. The fact that Luc Montagnier came to question some of what he had understood to be true later on and what indeed whether or not HIV was uh, the sole 
cause of AIDS, which is certainly not a mainstream position and it's not accepted within the establishment, but he was pursuing evidence. He didn't say, you have to listen to me. This is the only way to proceed. He said, I'm, I am wondering about this. And in COVID, uh, he, he came out early by in actually talking about lab leak. He said, I, I, I cannot I cannot comprehend, given what I've seen of this virus and a lifetime of research on viruses, and indeed as a Nobel laureate, that this particular virus could have a zoonotic origin. I, uh, and so he uh, he certainly was well outside the mainstream, and he has other other positions that are well outside the mainstream um, on COVID. But at the point that he died, the obituaries were a slow in coming. And uh, either so banal as to be clearly disrespectful in that regard, or um, or actually disrespectful. So let me let me just say this. I'm going to point to this. I chose. I said this to you earlier. I chose the wrong week to switch to Brave because nothing is quite simple anymore. Um, let me see if I can find it. Here we go. Okay. Um, Here's a, an obit in science, and one of the two premier science journals in the world published just two days ago, even though he died in early February. So that, that in itself is quite something. It's quite a short obituary. It has um, really nothing about his controversial positions. And it ends with this line. As Bjorn Venström, I don't know, I don't remember who that is, remarked at the 2008 Nobel ceremony, Montagnier was in the right place at the right time. That is so nasty. It's so nasty. And this is how, when someone has gotten so many accolades that it's really hard to make them into the fringe, this this is fringe making. Yeah. That's that's what that is. So that's- It's, that. it's hard coding the analysis that Luc Montagnier is fringe, that his success, which nobody disputes, is the result of luck. Right. Right. And- He it, was surrounded by good people. Right. And he got lucky. And yeah. let me tell you something scientifically speaking, right? We All of us who actually get how science works understands that it's a self-correcting process. And so this idea that science has arrived somewhere and we are all to follow it is bullshit from the get-go. Right. Um, but the basic point is, look, when somebody with a Nobel Prize, a relevant Nobel Prize, takes up a heterodox position, especially one with a high social cost, right? You don't necessarily know that that person is right, but you do know that you would need to know a lot in order to dismiss them, right? Mm -hmm. So let's just say, okay, you've got Luc Montagnier, one of his positions, you know, the thing for which he got the prize, the discovery of HIV, right? His later change of position involved his uh, emerging belief that HIV, the virus that he discovered, which nobody disagrees exists, is a co-traveler with AIDS and not causal. So mm -hmm. his new belief down regulates, downgrades the importance of the discovery for which he got the Nobel Prize. Of his Prize. own contribution. Right. So in right. a court, we would call that like statement against interest, mm -hmm. right? You're more likely to believe this because it's not something you would be expected to say because it's good for you to say it, right? right? So, okay, that's interesting. Does the fact that a somebody who, you know, is capable enough to get a Nobel Prize would reach this a paradoxical conclusion about the very thing for which they got the prize. That's interesting. Even more interesting when you get to the fact that uh, he wasn't the only Nobel laureate to reach that conclusion. Right. Right. Carrie Mullis, who also recently died and also was on the other side. He, he died at the very beginning, maybe even just before, bef before COVID. Yeah. Um, but he had already ended up on the wrong side of Anthony Fauci. Right. Um, he was alarmed by Anthony Fauci, and he was also alarmed by the uh, use of his invention for, uh, for testing for things like viruses because he knew PCR to be so sensitive yeah. that the cycle threshold issue made it possible to abuse it very easily. It was yeah. not an appropriate diagnostic tool. He won the Nobel for the... 
I guess we would say invention, invention in the case of, of polymerase chain reaction as opposed to the discovery um, in the case of Montagnier's prize of, of HIV. And actually, there's a connection. This is a connection that will come back uh, in, in a few minutes if I can remember it. Um, but the connection is, like many of our best tricks in medicine, PCR is, yes, it's an invention and a brilliant one. But it is borrowed almost entirely from nature, right? Right. Well, that's why I sort of pause. I'm like, it's it's an invention, um, but but it uses it, it's inspired by and uses many of the tricks that nature has used. Let's put it this way: it, it, its primary tools are enzymes that we could not have written. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Not even close. We just borrowed them from nature, and they do what they do, and you know they can be modified, but uh, but we just don't know enough to to do it. Okay, so. We've got this process of fringe making, mm -hmm. right? That has nothing to do. It's, you know, actually, you know what it is? It's an exact parallel to that thing we just described, right? This is the manufacture of an artificial fringe, like in the center of something, right? It's like you've got a carpet and you decide to put a fringe somewhere <laughs> in the middle of it in order that people don't pay attention to the stain or whatever, right? Because these people aren't fringe, yeah. right? Now, again, you don't know whether Luc Montagnier knows something far beyond what you understand at the point he says, no, no, HIV is not causing AIDS. You don't know whether he's goofed right. or he's got some deep insight. But what you mm -hmm. do know is that you can't casually dismiss it, mm -hmm. especially in light of the fact that he's going after Having his won own- Having won the Nobel, he's out of kook territory. He, he could be a kook, right. but the point is, a, what gets you to that level in science is something unusual. So at the point he says something really unusual and counterintuitive, especially something that downgrades the importance of his own discovery, mm -hmm. right? You have to listen. And then yep. at the point that you find another heterodox Nobel laureate, right, who has reached the same conclusion, Still doesn't make them right, but right. it does mean, hey, how much would you have to know before you were in a position to say, yeah, these people, they, they've lost the thread, right? Right. You'd have to, you'd have to know a ton, but instead, the point is, oh, well, that's a crazy. Everybody knows HIV causes AIDS. I was like, well, okay, everybody knows that, but you're now, it, you know, it's rather a lot like uh, Robert Malone, right? You want to say Robert Malone doesn't know what he's talking about with respect to the safety of these vaccines. Really? Then who does? <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, if anybody is likely to have insight, it would be Robert Malone. And if anybody was likely to be corrupt in the direction of thinking that they were safer than they are, you'd expect it to be Malone because that would yeah. make his invention that much more useful. Well, and there are a lot of these sleights of hand and they, they all have some there's some differences between them, but another one that comes to mind is, well, everyone knows that VAERS isn't reliable, that the you know vaccine adverse event reporting system isn't reliable. Like, oh, well, then what are we using? Right. Oh, oh we don't have anything but that? Like, okay, if we accept the, well, everyone knows that uh, initial, like, you can ignore the man behind the curtain part of the argument, um, there's almost always a, like, well, then who or what or you know, on what basis do you know that? You know, they did exactly this thing to me on the mice too. Right? Mm -hmm. Every time I tried to raise this issue about, hey, you've created an evolutionary environment in your mouse breeding colonies that has created mice that are lying to you and telling you that <laughs> drugs are safe, right? Yep. I got back. It's amazing how often people were like, everybody knows the mice are broken. And it's like, look, first of all, if everyone knows the mice are broken and you're using them for drug safety testing, then that's on you. Mm -hmm. Second of all, there's no reason they have to be broken this way. I can tell you how to fix the evolutionary mm -hmm. environment in those colonies. And the point is you're not interested because you just feel like, well, I'm in the know like everybody else, you know, and you're on the fringe. And it's like, no, the fringe is in the center of the goddamn carpet. Well, and again, I mean, that it's, it's a social argument as opposed to an argument about reality or about or about science, right? Like, you're telling me something I already knew, maybe, but two things, right? Like, you were in fact telling them, you were you were telling them something they already knew, but with so much more precision that you could actually, you actually had a solution for it. And, and um, the idea that because they knew something in that territory in advance, doesn't clear them of the responsibility for therefore basing all of their science on a, a bad model. Well, 
I was telling them something that they could plausibly dismiss as something they knew. Right. They didn't really know it, right? right. The fact of the, the telomere elongation, A, which didn't have to happen, that was the result of them not realizing that a colony is an evolutionary environment and not mm -hmm. realizing that it was going to have a particular uh, effect. But the point is, yes, all models are imperfect, right? A mouse is not a person. There were, are going to be ways in which a mouse is an imperfect model for people. Mm -hmm. We all know that. Um, the fact that it's broken in a particular way, especially a solvable way, right? You have to be a fool to dismiss the insight into how it's broken because if you could fix it, you know, if, if everybody knows the mice are broken, then wouldn't it be cool to have some mice that were less broken? Right. You know, so anyway, it's a, it's an interesting, I guess the point is it's all specific versions of a very generic game, right? The powerful yes. people are constantly fringing their <laughs> detractors, right? No matter how central those detractors are in the case of, you know, Corey, Tess Laurie, uh, Peter McCullough, Robert Malone. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, that's a process of like, forcibly uh, painting someone as a fringe when that's not, not what they are.